Shavua Tov Umevorach. We're going to be doing tonight Mishnah Gimon, Mishnah Dalet of Perek Sheni, the second chapter. Mishnah says, Hevu Zehirin Barashut. Be careful when you get involved with politics, with government, with kings. She'en mekarbin lo le'adam el l'sorech atzman. They only bring close a person for their own needs. Ne'in ke'ohavim b'shat hanata. They look like they love you at a time when you are giving them what they need, when you are giving them pleasure. However, they don't stand for a person when he's desperate, when he needs their help, they'll throw you to the curb. Mishnah Dalet says, He used to say, Make Hashem's will like your will. On a deep way, this can be understood to mean when a person has desire for something, let's say a nice, fat, juicy steak, he's excited to go to a nice, good restaurant, of course, a kosher restaurant, and he's ready to eat that steak, he's so excited for it. That's how you should do the return of Hashem. Make your will like Hashem's will, meaning make Hashem's will as exciting for you as it is when you do your own things, the things that you enjoy. And that will result in Hashem doing your will like His will. He'll be so excited to do what you want like that's his own will. And also negate your ratzon in front of his. When you want to do something and Hashem says, I want you to do something like this. As we know, evidenced by the things that Hashem is telling us to do in his Torah, we have a choice. Do this, which is what I want, or do what Hashem says. And we say, no, I'm going to negate what I want and give to God and do for God. So then what's going to happen is, Hashem will choose your desire, your will, what you want and what you need in favor of others who desire and, and want something else from Hashem relating to you. Meaning, let's say somebody wants to hurt you, and you want obviously your best, and the guy wants your worst. Hashem will negate the other person's will to give to you what you need. Hillel Omer. Hillel says now five things. Do not distance yourself from the public. This doesn't mean when everyone is doing something wrong, when they're going in and being involved in an endeavor which is not allowed and it's, permi- it's forbidden by the Torah. It means when they're doing a mitzvah, get involved. When everyone's doing a chesed, when everyone's doing tehillim, when everyone is learning Torah, join in. Don't be, don't be the outcome. Don't be the one that's on the outside. He's not involved with the public. And do not believe in yourself until the day you die. This does not mean don't have self-confidence. Rather, what it, mean is, what it means is, don't believe in yourself that your spiritual status is invincible, that it's titanium, it cannot be broken, it cannot be changed. Rather, until the day you die, until the day it's locked in, and you know that this is what I have, this is my spiritual status that I have attained, that's the day you know that you have taken that with you. But until that moment, there was people far greater than us, for 80 years they served as Kohen Gadol and in the last moments of their life they went and defected. So that teaches us a lesson. Never believe that the spiritual status you've attained is perfect. It's never going to be broken. Always continue to strive and continue to stand on guard to make sure we don't lose what we have gained. Number three, Do not judge your friend until you get into his spot. Until you're in his shoes, don't judge your fellow. And I'll let you just know this. You'll never be in your friend's shoes, ever. Therefore, never judge him. Number four. Do not say something which is impossible to be heard. You don't want it to be found out. Perhaps it's a secret. You don't want to say. You don't want the secret to get out to other people. Don't say it. In the end, it will be heard. In the end, people will find out. And don't say that when I have the time, I will learn Torah. Perhaps, maybe you will not have the time, you will not have the availability. And I want to focus on this last, last line. The Mishnah is saying, when a person says to himself, I will learn later, I will find time later, don't say that. Because what might happen is that you won't find the time later. And how true this is, we know this firsthand. We've had many experiences where we said, I'll go to the class later, I'll start learning tomorrow, I'll start my progress tomorrow. It doesn't happen. That's why a person says, right now, we should start right now. I said to Adcha make your learning set. Make it something that I do every single day. I have this time, I sit and I learn Torah, I sit and I make a schedule for myself and I know that I'm dedicated, I'm in at this time. We learn this concept from Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, rabbis tell us, he went to learn Torah for 12 years straight. He didn't come home. 12 years. 
And our rabbi said that when he came back home, he came back with a procession of students. Thousands and thousands of students came with him. And the Gemara, I believe, relates that his wife was having a conversation with the neighbor. And the neighbor said, don't you miss your husband? He's been gone for so long, 12 years, you haven't seen him. And his wife said, if I had the choice, I'd send him back for another 12 years. Rabbi Akiva was walking by at that moment and he hears from the window, he hears the exchange between his wife and the neighbor. And he says, if that's the case, I'm going to go back. He turns around and goes back. And everyone asks, one second, you finally came back. It's been 12 years. Surely it's a good time to just go inside, have a cup of coffee, spend the night, and then go back to learn 12 years. Of course, you couldn't have become the great disseminator of Torah the way he was without that learning. So I understand, go back, but just spend a few minutes. And a rabbi say, 12 plus 12 doesn't equal 24. For him to come home, he would have unwinded a little bit. He would have spent some time and went back. It's not the same as 24 years consistent, 24 years straight. But I have another little answer I'd like to share with you, which is that if he came inside and he had that cup of coffee, perhaps, perhaps, maybe he wouldn't have gone back the next morning so early. Maybe he would have delayed a little bit, would have slept in a little bit later. We don't know what would have happened. And so he said, I can't trust myself to say, I'll have time later, I'll have time, I'll be able to go back tomorrow. No, I need to go back right now. If I'm able to, I go back right now. That's the time to go. And I wanna take this line a little step further. Which is to say, eshne, which means to learn, can also mean to change. Don't say, when I have the availability, I will change. Because maybe you'll never get the time. Maybe your time will run out. And this is a very important lesson for us to understand that we always tend to think, we're always set, we don't think about uh, our life will ever have an end. But Bezat Hashem, we're going to live 120 years, but there's going to be a time when we're no longer going to be able to produce and so therefore, the Mishnah is teaching us, don't say when I have the opportunity to change, I will change. Before coronavirus, people said, when I have time, I'll change. Now with coronavirus, I have too much time. When I have less time and I'm more structured, then I'll change. It never, it never changes by itself. It's our job to change on our own. I'll just share with you a short story. In 1939 around, there was tens of thousands of, I think it's 10,000 actually is the right number of kinder transport, children that were taken out of Germany and Austria that were taken to different places, England, etc. And there was a group of children that were then put into an orphanage. And one of the children, we'll call him Daniel, was unconsolable. Every single day he would cry. Most of the other kids, they got over it. They had toys. They had different things. It worked out. This kid would just not stop crying. And so the people of the orphanage came to him and said, Daniel, what do you need to calm down? He said, I just need to speak to the king. Speak to the king, okay. The king is coming in a few weeks. At the time, King George VI was going around to the different places to try and spread his fame and his kingship. So he, went, he was going around and the king was supposed to come to this town in a few weeks. So they said, in a few weeks, Daniel, you have your chance. And they started teaching him proper etiquette to be able to meet the king. He's going to get a haircut. He's going to get all dressed up. And finally, the great day arrives. He's so excited. He walks out to the street and he's standing behind the barricade. And all of a sudden, he looks to his left and looks to his right and he sees the place is filling up. By the thousands, there's thousands of people there. And he realizes that he's been duped. He's not going to be able to meet the king and have a private audience. As soon as the king passes by in his chariot, he hops over the barricade. He starts running full force towards the king. The guards see him running out. They jump on top of him, tackle him, and handcuff him. The king hears about the commotion going on outside his carriage. He opens the door and he says, what's going on here? Bring the boy inside. The boy comes inside at first, he's a little bit shy, and soon he starts opening up and he tells the king about how his family's back in Europe and he feels so sad, he's, gonna miss, he's missing his family. And the king says, what can I do? It's impossible, we can't go into Germany and get him out. He says, but you're the king, you can do anything. And he says, let me see what I could do. A few days later, Daniel's sitting around in the orphanage and they call him in and he's, he's expecting to get a lashing for what happened the other day, how he acted out of order. And the head of the orphanage says, I want to sh just show you something that I think you'll be very happy to see. He puts him in the chair in his office and he opens the door of his office and his parents walk in. And the person that's relating this story to BBC in an interview, he's about 80s, in his 80s at the time. And he says to the man, I can never forgive myself. He says, forgive yourself for what? This is a story about Daniel. What do you have to do with this story? He says, I was standing right next to Daniel. I could have saved my parents too. Why couldn't I have been the one to go and jump over the barricade to run to the king? 
We all have an opportunity now in our lifetime right now. Today, this entire life that we have, we're able to go and make changes. There's going to be a day where we're going to look back at our past and say, why didn't I? And instead of letting it be, why didn't I do that? Say to ourselves, be able to say to ourselves, wow, look at the great things I was able to accomplish because I focused in the moment and said, what can I work on today? What can I change today? And what can I learn right now? Have a great night.